Hello, my friends. This is Barbara Gon Mueller, wife of Robert Mueller. To me, that is why we're together. I had the good fortune to marry Robert Mueller. You're welcome to join us anytime on peacepodcast.org to find out more about the world that Robert Mueller brought us into. It was 1994, 2000 days to the year 2000. I'm at a conference with Douglas Gillies. It's called The Invitational. And we're sitting there with the world leaders in front of us. And I look around and I realize, and I asked Douglas, how many days till the year 2000? And he says, 2000. I said, 2000 days to the year 2000. What a great idea for a book. So I say to the group of world leaders, I say, that's all right. One idea that you can give me at the end of this, maybe one idea a day. And then we will have 2,000 ideas, ideals for the, for the year 2000, and I'll write the book. Stone silence, not a word. And these are world leaders who have millions of ideas. Guess who stands up? Dr. Robert Mueller. I'll do it. And that began our relationship, Urban. Our relationship began when there were 2,000 days in 1994 to the year 2000. And it was like we gave birth to this baby. He would be in his cabin in Costa Rica when he went left our Santa Barbara location, La Casa de Maria. He'd go to the cabin in Costa Rica on a typewriter with two fingers. He would type an idea, 10, 15 a day. And here's the miracle. Do you realize this man never read what he wrote? And he only kept getting this this influence of ideas and he would just keep writing. And I say, well, you don't even check what you wrote. I don't need to. I know what I am going to say. He would go to bed at night early and he'd wake up at 4.30 and start writing. Find out what's your best time to give your brilliance to the world. He would start writing and writing. And I would get up and do the dishes and do what I needed to do. And I would do my journal and a few things like that. But frankly, I never worked as hard as he did, but that was his gift. And then I would go in and he'd say, here's my ideas. I'd hand them to the secretary. She'd type them up and I'd bring them back and he would edit them. And he would edit them with such love. I would go in there and say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm smiling at you and I'm editing my latest ideas. He was always so happy. <laughs> Even when the war took place, you know, this chapter is chapter five. And we're talking about the funny war. Even when the war was taking place, the French and the Germans shooting each other. Can you imagine cousins eating the same food? And they go home in whatever uniform they had. They were French, German. His grandparents changed nationality. Be sure you put your mute on, whoever's that. He was, they changed five times nationalities and his parents never even left their house but that's how it was. So in this funny war that Robert was in, Diane, we need you to mute my love because I heard your beautiful music. <laughs> and that's okay because look at Diane, yeah. she's going to do chapter six. She has known Robert since she was 11 years old. Her aunt said, there's one of us no. at the United Nations. And Diane Wait. said, what does that mean? And she said, there's a spiritual voice at the United Nations that's going to save our planet. And her aunt was so involved with making the world better through her understanding of spirituality, through using the invisible forces, etc. And then finally, she gave Diane an article about Robert. And she has been his fan. And she knew him before me, way before me, because she's she was 11 and she got all his books. Well, you're going to hear all about her a little bit later, but the best part of the ice cream of her cake was she got to go to Peru with Robert. Being in Peru. Barbara, you're telling yes. us next week's story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. So, Diane, you'll see. You'll be you'll love hearing from her in Chapter 6. So let's go back a minute. What was it about this Chapter 5 that brought you to here today? Was it the teacher that told Robert that he didn't have to requote everything that he read in the book? And he said, I want you to be who you are. Is that what, Robert, you've got from this chapter? 
So today we have Irvin on because he's going to tell us how his relationship with Robert Mueller formed his life and how Robert Mueller and he worked together. But I'm going to read something to you. This is Prophet the Hatmaker's Son, the Life of Robert Mueller. You know that's why we're together in the Peace Community Book Club. But I'm going to read what Ted Turner said. You all know Ted Turner, founder of CNN. I could tell you how it got started. It got started on the 37th floor when Ted went to Robert and said, Robert, I'm done. I won the I won the cup. I don't know what to do with my life. And Robert said, we need world news. Well, you know what the next step was? Ted Turner started CNN. But anyway, Ted Turner and so many people on this planet got an idea from Robert. So let me just read what Ted Turner said. Robert Mueller had a very large influence on me. He has a wonderful global outlook and a loving, kind-hearted attitude of forgiveness, understanding, and patience. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, because patience, sometimes the ideas we have in our life don't happen now, and they have to take off when we're ready to make them into reality, and it may be after our life is done. He came, he became one of the greatest men to come along and the greatest influence in my life. That's Ted Turner. I'm going to read one line from Douglas Gillies, who is on today. Welcome, Douglas Gillies. Douglas Gillies produced six documentaries in addition to Prophet the Hatmaker's Son. It took him two years sitting next to Robert every single week, reading and writing and listening to Robert. So it was almost like they were co-authors of this book. They're sitting at the dining room table. Douglas has done the research. They go to the archives and they come out and Robert says, well, what'd you do this week? And Douglas brings out the document that he wrote about Robert. And Robert and he would sit for two hours and they would just go through it word by word. So in addition to this prophet, the hat maker's son, he also did six documentaries, a wake up call about the state of the world, featuring Mikhail Gorbachev, Jane Goodall, Ted Turner, Houston Smith, Oren Lyons, and Robert Mueller. He began the documentary of Robert Mueller's life in 1994, when there were 2000 days to the year 2000. And so with that, He comes well qualified because he started out as a person who believed in peace. And so with that, I'm going to introduce the next person who really believed in peace. In fact, I wouldn't be here today if my Hungarian grandfather wouldn't have decided after the coffin maker was piling up the coffins in his little town of Budapest or at that time, it might even have been Romania, because Romania changed names from Romania to Hungary. And I'm not sure what it was called, but he did see the coffin maker piling up the coffins before World War I. And Robert and I and my grandfather said, we don't believe in war. And so when my grandfather said to the coffin maker, what are you doing building all those coffins? And he said, we're going to need them. The war is coming. He got on the boat and went to Ellis Island. He was he left because he does not believe in war. But when he left, he got on the boat to Ellis Island, as I just said, and he met my grandmother. They were both in their teens and they met on the boat. So I'm 100 percent Hungarian. On that same boat was my father's mother. Who would have thought all these people leaving Hungary to come to the U.S. would be part of my heritage? my life. I wouldn't be here if they wouldn't have taken the courage, 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 courage. We all have that word and Robert had it in tenfold. The courage to do what you know is right. And I'm reading this book on change and it keeps saying, do your life affirming priorities. Anyway, I'm giving you advice as I read because I this morning, I was overwhelmed by the joy of reading chapter five where Robert learned from his teacher that he needed to be himself. He had to go inside and be who he was and not regurgitate what he read in books. Now, going back to my grandfather, he's in the United States now. He's done his thing. And now he's in California. My parents are in Denver and we travel to California and we stay on his little farm, et cetera, et cetera. Now, fast forward, I'm three years old. And what does my grandfather say to me? 
young lady, you're going to be a peacemaker. I said, Grandpa, I'm only three years old. How am I going to be a peacemaker? He said, but look at all the years you have to be a peacemaker. So that's kind of the preface about me being a peacemaker, a Hungarian background. I can make the best goulash in the world, the best chicken paprikash and palancinta, you name it. Right, Irvin? We can cook Hungarian, let me tell you. So with that, I'm going to introduce our guest today. I had to tell you I'm Hungarian. I'm so proud of it. You know, the fact that my parents met at a Hungarian picnic, no surprise. Our middle name is Food. Hungarian, Barbara, Food, Barbara. We all eat. If I made my first communion, we'd have a gigantic feast. If I graduated from college, we'd have another. Everything was about food. That was their, sh their form of love. Hungarians are really food addicted. Why not? But good food addicted. And I remember the stories that we would talk about why peace was important. My grandfather would, and grandma would come to dinner all the time. And what was our conversation? How do you make peace possible? What are we going to do to make this world work? And so today I introduce my Hungarian friend, Urban Laszlo, a systems philosopher, theorist, classical pianist first, twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He has authored, to get this, more than 70 books, which have been translated into 19 languages and has published in excess of 400 articles and research papers, including six volumes of piano recordings. I wish I could get some of your recordings. I love piano. Dr. Laszlo is generally recognized as the founder of systems philosophy. Let me tell you, when you read his books, you will understand why they say he is the founder of systems philosophy. And so with that, I'm going to say, Irvin Laszlo, welcome. We are so honored to have you here. And you know, you have so much to offer. And so with that, I welcome you, Irvin. Barbara, okay, wonderful. So nice to be here with you and chat a little bit about life and about our acquaintance or my acquaintance, your life together with rubber. So this is, this is a very good occasion. Let, why don't you take this conversation as you like? Let, let me just respond to, to the ideas that you have and what you, what you foresee. Well, you know, Irvin, you have been such a major force of change on the planet. And I was thinking that if you would talk a little bit about the changes that you saw at the United Nations when you were there with Robert and you were seeing this first time we ever had a global voice and it was right after the League of Nations. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Talk about peace. What, you, what did Robert mean to you? Well, United Nations. Robert meant to me United Nations to begin with. And that was the lasting influence. You know, I moved to the UN on the invitation of the Director General of, UN of UNITAR, the Institute for Training and Research. And uh, coming out from Princeton, where I did a series of seminars on the systems approach to the world order. And this, out of this came a, a book called uh, the, the, the future, future Studies and the, the, the Next Future. And then out of this came an invitation to go to the UN. The first day, I, am, I accepted this invitation from the, from the executive director of UNITAR, and I moved into an office right across from the secretarial building. Uh, UNITAR had its own building. At, and 46th Street, just across from the UN, 45th and 46th. And uh, the first day I was sitting there and uh, trying to find my way around, two gentlemen showed up. One, you can guess, was Robert Muller, and the other one was Donald Keyes, who was the founder and, and head general manager of the World Citizens in, uh, Association or, or Initiative. So they were, they were there and smiling and welcoming me. And they brought what appears to be to me uh, the spirit of the UN, which is difficult. It's not a bureaucracy. 
So that is an aspect. It's not a fight for, for privilege, which also has that kind of an aspect, or for national sovereignty and all that. It is a spirit of peace and cooperation and accomplishment. Robert has been very clear about the challenges, but he had the confidence that the UN can meet the challenges. It was always like he would be thinking of the UN as his brainchild, as an adopted child, as it were, because he thought of the UN as an organization that can solve many of the problems of the world by coming together and tackling them together. And that was his, his credo, always with a smile, always with a positive attitude, and here I am, and this is the series of things we have already been doing, always rehearsing the things that the UN has already accomplished, and the things that we need to go is not looked at not as, as, as something, a task that is a formidable, but as a challenge that we need to surmount, that we can surmount, almost, almost a privilege to be able to work on this, seeing the world as a united, united peoples, United Nations, yes. We, we used to know a little bit, we talked about it, that the United Nations is, is, has to, should be really called peoples because the nations themselves very often consider themselves sovereign and you can't unite a sovereign person. A sovereign person is by, by itself alone, it's sovereign. You can't be united. So we all agree that it should be really the people, the cultures of the world who come together. And that's the dream I think that Robert has that I've had. So he, he and, and, and Donald Keyes, who founded the, the World Citizens Movement, I still have a passport, a World Citizens passport that was given at the time. And when I travel every once in a while, I pull that out and show it. And then the, the, the people, the border, border guards just look at me and then either smile or, or shake their heads, hands, heads. But most of the time they are, they understand that's what I mean. Idea is that I can pull up two other passports, the Hungarian and the United States passport, or my, my, my permit of, of or sejour of the permit of, of residence of for Italy where I now live. So I can show any one of those things, but I prefer to see show the world citizens passport, which I still have. The world citizens passport, that is really accomplishment, wasn't it, at that time? Yes. Yes. And we are hoping that that this would be something that could be realized. At the time, as be, being a member of the Secretariat of the United Nations, one traveled in a laissez-passer, you know, as a passport that eliminated very many of the visa requirements. We are talking about the 1970s, 1980s, where a lot of the work, countries of the world needed formal visas to, 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 enter, to enter into. But uh, Robert and and had had this less had the UN passport. I had a UN passport. He had a red one because he belonged to the uh, to the top level of the UN organization around the Secretary General. I had a blue one, but I was one of the directors of the programs. But anyway, we could we could we could travel, and it was something that we were proud of. We were proud of belonging to the United Nations, be, being a world citizen. And this is something that was stayed with me. I was not sure what will await me at the UN when I moved there. From, from I was in the academic world up till then. Uh, at Princeton already, I was giving seminars on, on the world order, on, on the systems approach to world order. But I was still in the academic world and I thought, surely I've spent a year on loan to the United Nations, then I go back mm -hmm. to the We'll go back to my university, the State University of New York. But uh, partly, I think, very large part uh, to, due to Robert's influence and Donald's and some other key people at the UN Secretariat who were idealists, but, but viewers were realists, knew how to do things, how to go after the ideals without engaging in just uh, daydreaming. They were doing, doers, but their influence 
led to the fact that after my year at UNITAR as a special fellow was up, I accepted the, to be a director of one of the programs. The, uh, I created a program actually at UNITAR on regional and interregional cooperation. The idea is how to get people, the countries of the world, to cooperate more thoroughly when they had were divided so much. What Willy Brandt at the time has called it the dialogue of the death of the death, you know, talking to each other but but not hearing each other. The 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 north and the south, you know, separate, separate interests. How to get interregional cooperation at work. So I, I spent four years at the UN as director of this program at UNITAR, working directly for the Secretary General and being a very close contact with Robert Mueller. And they were very formative years for me. I was always happy, never regretted I spent those years. It was a lot of work. I was a bureaucrat. I tried to be a, a positively thinking one. I recognized that I spent 70, 80% of my time on what we now consider red tape. I had to be done with com those committees and, and declarations and, and various form, form, formulations that's what I had to go through. But the remaining time that I tried to do on creating agreements for cooperation. In fact, I succeeded to, to create a, a group of high level people, foreign ministers and ministers of the interior from the developing world to come together to sign a declaration on, on, the, on the regional inter-regional inter cooperation. And it was a declaration that we then submitted to the Secretary General. So this was a, a work of love and a work that I was convinced is needed and the work that, work that I'm now convinced is more needed, today more needed than ever. You know, it's so interesting because you made that comment early in your conversation about Robert greeting you. I don't care who came to the UN, he happened to be there to greet you and welcome you. And um, I remember him talking about when he met you, he thought, here's a Hungarian who has the same philosophy I have. I was, I'm a French German person and here I am out the same ideas. And then this leads to the next question I have for you. Um, I know about the club of Rome and you started the club of Budapest. Talk a little bit about that because if it wouldn't have been for the club of Budapest, I never would have met my great, great, great grandfather who was on some horse in the middle of the Parthenon. So talk a little bit about the club of Budapest and what your dreams are for that. Well, it's still going and hopefully it's just not, just not starting a new, ep new epoch, relaunching the club with, with, with fresh ideas and more inputs also, hopefully to the finances of it and to the people who are doing it. We have 24 national clubs in the world, you know, more cooperating and we are trying to develop joint programs for them. The reason for it, for the Club of Budapest was that when I worked for the, when I was a member of the Club of Rome, uh, almost from the beginning, we did so many, so many meetings. That was a way, maybe two, two, two ways that the Club of Rome has worked through conferences, bringing together leaders of the world, and through reports to, to the Club of Rome. He said, never, not the Club of Rome has issues the reports, but they invite people to submit, to do reports, the commission's reports, as it were. And uh, so I did one of those reports also on, on goals for mankind. But the reason is that I found that the Club of Budapest was that I realized that when the meetings that we have, top level people come together and we all talk about what's important, how we could work together, create a peaceful world. But not all, a residue remains, but God knows the majority of the, of the goodwill and the in indications of what we want to do disappear Monday morning afterwards when people go back to their job. And they have the political constraints most of the time, of course, their financial constraints, their personality problems, all of those things. So there is a, a need to talk not only to leaders, Club of Rome was talking primarily to business leaders and some scientists, not many, but a few, and uh, political leaders, you know, 
uh, ministers and, and deputy ministers, mostly former ministers, people, ministers who are already still in power, still in office, I don't have that freedom to act. They have to watch what they're saying. Once you become a former prime minister, you know, or, 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 or deputy prime minister or foreign minister, you can be welcome to say what you want. It's your opinion then. So the Club of Rome consisted mostly of these people. Very good, very important. But we did not carry a, a weight of conviction, didn't communicate sufficiently with people. So I said, let's try to get people on board at the Club of Rome who can talk to the people, who can communicate in such a way that people say, ah, yes, that is meaningful. That's something that, that could change my, the way I look at the world. It could change my consciousness, change my, my life, perhaps. So I thought, let's create what I called initially a workers, a, 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 a writers, a poets, and no, wait a minute, what they call it, uh, a musicians and, and writers club. A club where all these people who are creative in the are creative in the arts would come together, and they would they would send a message from the heart, from through their work to people. So people came together when I founded this. I had a good fortune to be at the time in India. I was uh, serving as chairman of the Auroville Commission. Auroville, you know, is that international city in India in the south near Pondicherry. And this is, doesn't strictly belong to, to India. It's an international city. And uh, a committee was brought together. Very much the ideals of, of, of Robert were, were incorporated there. I was in India at that time because twice a year I went to, to serve on this committee, which was a liaison committee between Auroville as an international city and the, and the state and government of India. So I was there and I heard from the, my colleagues there that in the neighboring city, a couple of hours drive away in India, that's a very small distance, of course, all the other distances are enormous. Uh, in Madras, which is now called Chennai, it was called Madras at the time, that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is visiting there. And some of the people who were uh, serving on my committee from the Indian side were going to this meeting with the Dalai Lama, because the Dalai Lama was very interested in, in our will as an example of how we can live peacefully without being you know, narrowly uh, boxed into a given nation or a given organization. So they were invited and I said, could you invite me also? They said, well, we will try. So His Holiness said, uh, looked at his schedule and, and they said, well, we have five minutes. <laughs> I, went down to, I went over to, to five minutes verse every minute of it to, to make the tip. Yes, I went over there and, and the Dalai Lama asked me, what am I doing? At that time, I was busy working on a declaration for the, for the Club of Budapest, or, or, on a manifesto, we called it, on the, new parad on, the, on the new consciousness, on the spirit of new consciousness. And uh, I said, this is what I'm doing. I'm working, I'm working on this manifesto. And, and His Holiness said, can you, can you read some of it? Or can I have a look at it? I started reading it and I took it from my hand, gave it to his secretary and said, well, you continue reading. And it took a while because it was several pages long and his holiness kept commenting and, and, and saying uh, what he thought he should go into it. Time passed and actually there was about three hours or three and a half hours passed. <laughs> and most of his appointments were, were, were delayed obviously. And when he came down to seeing who else he would see, he said, well, I continue tomorrow. Now I want to still think about this manifesto. So this is how uh, the Club of Budapest was really started with adopting the manifesto. I asked some top level people, writers and artists and poets and musicians to come and join this. The first person I asked, of course, was His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He said, you do something like this? Certainly, I want to join. So 
he was in the second person, actually, because the first person was the president of Hungary. And since it was to be called the Club of Budapest, the president of Hungary had to be the, one of the founding members of it, Arpad Gönc. And Gönc was one of those rare presidents, like Václav Havel, who was also a poet, a poet, a writer. He translated the works, some of the works of Shakespeare into Hungarian. So Arpad Gönc was a great intellectual. He died a few years ago. But he, for many years, he was the president of the Republic of Hungary. So he was one of the members, a first member. The Dalai Lama was the second member. Peter Ustinov, whom I met and shortly after that, became the third member. Yehudi Menuhin, whom I met in Budapest, he came to conduct the concert. Uh, I came to him and said, well, would you join the Club of Budapest because of poets and artists and musicians club? And he said, of course, yes. Then there was Liv Ullmann, and I could go on, you see. The first members were all world-renowned people from the arts, from the cultural sphere. Uh, so this is uh, some, some initiative that I wanted to continue. We allow people, if I ask in fact people, if they would themselves form little clubs of their own, wherever they live, form a club that will carry the name of the country, and this also got going first in France and in Germany and in Sweden and uh, of course Hungary, uh, but then also in the East, in India, in Japan, we ended up with 24 national clubs. And I offered this to the Club of Rome, but I must say the Club of Rome, some people, actually just one or two people without mentioning names are worried that this will be a rival. I thought of it as a partner and a compliment to the Club of Rome, who works primarily with statesmen and, and, and business leaders, you know. I thought this is a writers and, and physicians club will, will complement that. But we had to agree that, okay, the Club of Rome does these things, and afterwards they were changing, but at first it was like that. And I would do, to bring together the Club of Budapest as an independent organization. That's why we call it the Club of Budapest, because the first founding meeting was in Budapest, just like the founding meeting for the Club of Rome was in Rome. We created it in Budapest, and uh, we still have the headquarters in Budapest. Oh, I, I love going to the meetings at the Club of Budapest, because it was like I was in this think tank of Nobel laureates who could have all been Nobel Peace Prize winners, including yourself. You could have been a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And I sat there with these these ideas just pouring out of people. And I kept thinking, as you said earlier today, changing the consciousness of people is not easy because we get caught up in our own, I don't even know what to say, our own lives. And so changing the consciousness, I thought that was kind of your goal for the Club of Budapest. Is that correct? Yes, that's how we wrote on this, wrote, created this manifesto mm -hmm. on, the, on the new consciousness. You know, planetary consciousness. At the time, you know, people said, what do you mean planetary? I said, does the planet have consciousness? Of course it does. But I mean, they didn't want to make things difficult by saying so right away. I said, no, no, it means that our consciousness is embracing. It embraces the planet with all living things on the planet. So it's, a, it's what you call a global consciousness, a world consciousness. We call it the spirit of planetary consciousness and his holiness, the Dalai Lama like that. So we kept that title, you know. So obviously we think consciousness is a key and that's why I was working then afterwards very much on what we call the new paradigm, the new consciousness paradigm. Because I think how we think is key to how we act. And how we act is today is very much a key to the future that we will have. So it hinges very much on our consciousness, your consciousness and mine, how the future will be, whether mankind even survives on this planet. But he could not only survive, he could flourish, he could thrive on this planet, but not by going the way we have been going. We have to go with the new ideas, with the ideas that Robert has jotted down has been devoted to. You need these ideas as funding, founding, and determining reality in the world, always in front of us to follow it. 
So we need Robert now. We have his spirit. We have you and your friends to carry this forward. And that's a very important element in creating a better future for all of mankind. A better future for all of mankind. You know, when we were there, um, for the Club of Budapest meeting, you said, don't come empty handed, come with your ideas. What is your agenda for the future? And I remember Robert and I sitting in the hotel room and writing down our agenda for the future. And the first idea was to make our planet the paradise it was meant to be. And that's it. In a nutshell, isn't it? If we do that, everything else that isn't working has to disappear. Well, now we need that. Now we really need it. We, make, we have to make the planet according to what we believe in. We have to believe in the right thing, not on being selfish, egocentric, and not on being looking short-term horizons. We need to believe in what the, even the new sciences, the quantum sciences tell us about a world that is a whole, a world where all parts are in communication with every other part. World, a world that is like a hologram, where all the information is every bit of the whole in the hologram, but all the information that creates a hologram is in there in every part of it. And nowadays we know that the best metaphor are similar for understanding the nature of reality, the nature of physical reality, which is also a nature of, of, of spiritual reality. At the bottom reason, the bottom nature of reality is and undivided whole, which is very much, I think, uh, Robert's idea has been and, and continued to all his life. No absolute division. We all belong together. And this is what the new sciences are telling us. And we've got to wake up and work along the ideas, the, along the ideas of a new paradigm and uh, belonging together being part of this tremendous mothership, which is life on Earth, the system of life on Earth. You know, I just had a chat come in from Desmond, and he asked if the manifesto is available somewhere so we can all can read and enjoy it, the manifesto from the Club of Budapest. It is, it is on, 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 on the internet. Planet, manifesto on planetary consciousness. I think you'll find it like that. Thank you. You know, you, I have to tell people, because I asked you one day, I said, I, we were working with um, the publisher of your books in San Francisco and uh, working with your literary agent. And I said, Irwin, how did you write all those books? How could you write so many books? And you said, well, this is how I do it. I sit down at a table with nothing on the table. I bring some blank paper and I start to write. And all of a sudden this book becomes reality. Now, what does that tell you? Were you tuning in to the universe? Were you tuning in to your higher self? What happens to you when these books emerge from your consciousness? Well, I start writing. I think I have a key, a key idea, something you must start, a motivation. Yes, this is something that you have to think about, you know, and I start sketching out what, what is needed, what the problem is, you know. And then allow things to flow. And they, they just come. By the way, I must correct the, uh, your intro. You said something about 70 books. It's 106 books by now. <laughs> oh. oh, pardon me. I thought you only wrote 70. <laughs> yes. I think a few years ago, this was on my, on my CV, yes, 70 books. If you count them all, and plus count the foreign editions also, then you are in the, about 185. You are something. I don't, you know, you're just like Robert. Do you think that you and Robert are going to have a good time when you go to the eternal life 10 years from now? <laughs> well, I, I try to stick around for a while. Well, you know, it's so interesting because Robert said to me before he passed away, you know what I'm going to do after I pass away? What are you going to do? I'm going to come back and I'm going to whisper in the heads and on the ear of every person who's in charge of anything important and tell them they have to work for peace. I'm going to whisper in their ear. So have you gotten any whispers lately from Robert Irvin? I think so. We are all trying to whisper. Yeah, we're all trying to whisper. Nowadays, you can whisper through the Internet. And that's one something that I'm trying to do. People are now on the internet, they might want to look at uh, yes, my institute, the Institute of New, uh, the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research, 
again, just on dot com, you will find it like that. You know. If you want to look at some of my books, you have the the, the ervilazlobooks.com, you have all my books listed there, you know. Not all of them, but the recent books anyway. So I think we can we can try whispering in a way that people have access to and we try to make some sense. I like what you said. You sit down at this blank table and then you say, what's needed now? What are the yes. problems? And let that download come. And you know, a lot of things come from our knowing. And that's why I love chapter five so much, because chapter five talks about the professor that said to this, to Robert, don't just tell me what's in the books. Don't just tell me what's in the books. Tell me what you think. What are your ideas? And Robert became a full human being from this idea that what he could do was already inside. Of course, he was very learned, but still, it's what we know. Is that what happens for you? It's like you bubble up all these ideas that have been wisdomly keeping you alive at night? Well, when you are on the right way, on the right tech, then things start flowing. The ideas come. If you, are, if you are blocked, uh, writer's block, I usually don't, I seldom have that. But if that happens, or sometimes even very funnily, even technical faults, you know, you just, you, just, you just can't get through. You try to get a conversation like this on the internet and, and things don't open. Then you will wonder, you know, if that was the right thing to do at this time. The, even the topic was doing it some different way. Douglas, uh, mute yourself, Douglas. Mute, mute yourself, sweetheart. This is our oh. author. There he is. You see him in full color. Um, okay. Herber, we'll go back to you now, please, Urban. Okay. No, I, I, I just, to, just to end on this, I think if you allow yourself to be guided, one does get guidance. I have tried to work that out and also why that is happens. And I, my conclusion is, that I write this up in much more detail, of course, that evolution, the evolutionary imperative, the, the why protons and neutrons form a, a nucleus of a hydrogen atom and why certain atoms, uh, certain electrons, not all, certain electrons that fit into the uh, shells that surround this nucleus come together and then they create a hydrogen atom that can join with, uh, with with oxygen atoms and create water, why that creates the molecules and life and, and even consciousness. It's not by chance. It's not just, it so happens. This is not a random universe. In fact, people have counted out that uh, random, random interactions would not have been able to create a com complex and coherent world that we have today in the time that elapsed since the Big Bang, which we consider is usually as the beginning of this process, which is the process that created the universe. So this is a highly informed universe, highly formed by information. And that information is in every part of the universe. It is in the galaxies. It is in the system of life on Earth, in the Gaia system. It's in each of us. It's in, e in each atom of, e of our body. It's there. But we overlay it, we ignore it. We act as though it wouldn't exist. We substitute something else for it, just short-term goals. But it's there. And when you really need it, when you allow it, I think it will come forth. And then you can follow it. The way out of this today's predicament of the, the, the semi-chaos that is, is so full of crisis today, the way out is to allow that deep impetus for evolution to surface. Because evolution means the love of one part of two for another so they can together evolve. Evolution is the love affair of the universe, actually. I got to quote you, evolution is the love affair with the universe. Holy cow, how can anybody say anything more profound than that? You know, actually, we said that together with Barbara, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Barbara, the other Barbara, not, not Barbara Gould. You're really. talking Barbara Marx Hubbard? Barbara Marx Hubbard, thank you. Yes, yes, my friend, who's no longer with us. Love affair, go ahead. We, we talked about this evolution as being the love effect of the universe some years back. And Barbara said, let's write a book like this together. And I said, agreed. 
I think we will somehow see if we can really download enough of... of, of I'm sure it's on the Amazon too. But yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Things just come out of you that you, 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 when you're writing and you're probably saying, well, where'd that come from? But it's just perfect. The evolution is the love affair with the universe. Think about that. And people just get that um, in the chat. If you are wanting to find the manifesto, Joyce put in the link and there's other wonderful things in the chat, including Joni, who was at the early the first meeting of the Club of Budapest. And I'm yeah. sure we were there also. Joni was is on our chat today. I'm in our uh, podcast. As you look around, Irvin, I'm sure you see a lot of friends here because um, you see Jerry and Desmond Bergdoffer who are going to be bringing you into the Visioneers. And we're going to get to that in about five minutes. Is there anything that you'd like to leave the world to know right now to, as you are getting winding down our talk? What do you want the world to know? What do you want people to hear? Because you are such a visionary. I mean, I, I just marvel at it. And when you came to visit us in Goleta, Santa Barbara area, I just sat there and I said, this is Irvin Laszlo in my front porch with your beautiful wife. And I'm thinking, how have I been so lucky to know that these world leaders would come to the house, sit at our table, walk in our garden, and share those moments. And that was so special. Thank you, Irwin. So what do you want the world to know? Well, I, I coined the term, I just, just like we talked about planetary consciousness with the Dalai Lama. Nowadays, I talk about a term that I think it makes sense, but I, I try to use that as a key to everything. I, I send all the messages that I can send. The term is upshift, upshift shifting up because it, it cannot stay as we are we need to shift obviously it's not a stable world it's not a sustainable world if you are not careful we continue in the old path you know we are we are encounter more and more crisis and this will be a down shift a downward shift what is an upward shift is to go with evolution to, to evolve to the next level which is a more manifest love of all things for all other things, unconditional love that we can feel, that people increasingly feel, feel that we belong. That's the evolutionary step towards which we're heading. That's the upshift. And I try to spell this out in a, in a short book, 120 pages or so. Uh, it's called The Upshift the path to healing and evolution on planet Earth. So that's, if you're interested in my message, that's what I try to communicate. And I, I used it to Club of, uh, Club of Budapest, the Laszlo Institute. Now we are creating a talk show based on that. Upshift conversations, we hope the next month, next month, next month will start a series like this. And so uh, many things that are going on, I, I try to do the upshift movement also, where people can just look at the internet also on, on, on upshift movement. Uh, you find that you can fill in your ideas. I think Robert would, would be filling that in all the time, nonstop. But anybody can go to that, fill in your ideas. And then we look at it and we try to build, bring together like-minded people together and, and they enable them to realize their dreams and their projects. So that's the upshift movement. Everything is at this critical moment in our destiny is to have a positive vision, a constructive vision, not a, a mere idealistic optimism, but a constructive world worldview moving toward the next level for evolution pulling out of the crisis. The crisis is the birth of a new, a new world. The world in crisis, now we can shift. So let's learn from each other. Let's learn from discussions, from conversations like we're having, how to shift up. We can learn from each other, Irvin. And as I look at you, I realize that you're one of the wisdom keepers. And I thank you for all the books you've written. I thank you for being our guest today. And we have a couple minutes before we go to the point where we're going to get people to have things they need us to know. Is there anybody that has a burning question besides David Wick? I see his hand up. Who'd like to ask you a question. Are you open for that, Erwin? Okay. 
Okay, yeah. David Wick is um, on Pathways to Peace, Rotary E Club of World Peace. David, please. Hi, thank you very much. I, I, what you're talking about is is really um, a key. Um, I was very disturbed, I think it was yesterday, reading in the news about a, um, a Republican big conference and so on like that. And with key people, they were talking about ab absolutely assault on the, what they're talking about, the, the barbarians taking over the country. So, but it's a direct assault and it's poison that is being pumped out. Huge, we know that. So the antidote to that is bringing out the more of the, the world view that people could, can touch people's heart and help them see another possibility. Is that the key? Because it has to be beyond the, the choir. I mean, all of us are doing major things, but it has to go out into the general public at large. Is that what you see is the way to go? Absolutely. In fact, there is no other good way to go. We must somehow find a new view of ourselves and of the world, not as separate individuals who are just all pursuing a short-term selfish goals without regard to anybody and anywhere else, but a world in which people feel that they belong together, that they are part of it. A new worldview. All the rest is just patching up the worst for a little while, but it all falls back as long as we still think the old way, a new way of thinking. I call it the new paradigm of thinking based on, on the new quantum sciences, but it's a paradigm that has been there in Christianity. It has been, it's there in, in, in Tao in the East, you know, it's there in, in all the teachings of the, great, of the great prophets. Love, yes belonging together, acting together. So that worldview, which is now supported by the new sciences. It's like a common intention to love the world and to make the world safe for all. That's our common intention. Yeah, absolutely. And that's supported by the new sciences, quantum physics, quantum biology, quantum psychology, you know, and quantum social uh, consciousness research, you know. It's all, we had no separateness. You know who said that, Einstein. Separateness is an illusion. So we are not separate. We, are, we belong together. So let's act like that. It's really but, powerful when you we, say it like that, Erwin. We love each other because, because this, we are part of each other. What, you, what I do to you is to, I do to myself. What I do to anybody, I ultimately do to myself. If you just start realizing this, we will be acting more carefully, more wisely on this earth. What you do to anybody, you do to yourself. Jim Halderman, do you have a question, please? Uh, unmute, yeah, unmute. All right, got it. Uh, uh, maybe it's not such a quick question, but anyway, I wonder if I just became aware of his library and anxious to uh, uh, dive in. And I'm starting with and downloaded the Immortal Mind. And uh, I even had an opportunity to teach a class on on mindfulness and and where is the mind outside of the brain? I I start with teaching the double slit theory to to show to help people understand that everything is matter or wave, whatever. So where is the mind? Uh, and I'm anxious to read uh, the immortal mind uh, to to hear your views, because I I feel when you talk about upshift. Mindfulness is such an important part to be quiet and open and listen, connect, as you said, to connect with the uh, greater, the greater mind, which is not our brain, um, if you care to. You have to learn that the world is not local. The world is non-local. The world is not local. Thank and you. the world is a whole, an indivisible, indivisible whole which only artificially, we fragment it artificially, and we get a very false image of the world. You know? So holism and non-locality, key elements, which tell us that we are part of an evolving universe where evolution is embedded in us. Life is strongly oriented toward evolution. You know how every niche on earth that is capable of supporting life as sooner or later life is developing at the deep seas near volcanoes, volcanoes everywhere in the universe even near hot stars uh, 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 organic molecules have been found and are being found evermore you know 
So where we thought that life could not be possible, it is possible everywhere where it is the least physical basis for life, life emerges. It's a living universe, it's a life-oriented universe. And life in that sense means like Ilya Prigozhin, you know, the, the great phys physicist, physical chemist, showed that in a living in a, in a quantum system, yeah. every element from far from equilibrium Every element is coherent with every other element and it's working together. And we have got to learn that we can only survive if we are coherent with each other, if we are constantly resonate with each other. It's a big lesson. I think classical tribes have learned that and native indigenous people have very often learned that. Yes. But the modern world in the last couple of hundred years has forgotten it. So it's time to get back to that. I think. You know, we're all connected. You're just saying that right now. We're all connected. If we have a common intention and we're all connected, right? We are. We are deep down, whether we like it or not. That's the way it is. We are connected. But if we ignore this, we ignore it at our peril. Because then we destroy the coherence of this overall system. God bless you. Joni, please. I just want to thank you, uh, Irvin, for this incredible reconnection with your work and with Robert. Uh, it's wonderful to see you looking so well and, and still giving us your very deep and powerful ideas. Thank you. Thank you for all of your contributions to my life and to our planet. It's very, very important. Thank you. And I second that, Joni. Joni was at your first meeting of the Club of Budapest, and, and she is carrying the light wherever she goes with the pathways to peace to bring us all together. You're looking at your tribe. When you look around, uh, I'm going to put it on gallery view because I want you to see who really, we love you, Irvin. We love what you say. We know that you are trying and have tried for a hundred and so many books. And we're here, your ambassadors, we're your messengers. We're here to make sure that your wisdom is not something that is not translated in our beingness and where we are. And with that, I just want to thank you. I, I echo the words from Joni. I echo the applaud that David Wick gave us. And each person on here could be your best friend, because they have that pure consciousness that they know what they're doing is important. Thank you, Dee, for showing us that. Dee is, every one of us have a purpose bigger than we even realize. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you, Irvin. Stay as long as you want. I'm going to have the video. Please. Uh, I have one small or big request. Let's start acting on this. Can I have your permission to use this talk in a talk show series that I'm starting. I would, I would like to make this available widely to our, 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 our hours conversation now, I think. If you, if you enable that, I think I'll be very grateful and I think we will carry this to a wider public. Thank you, bless your heart. So Jean um, Houston recently is, was interviewed by The Visioneer. She's going to be on a special program that Desmond and Jerry are doing. And um, Irvin is also one of the heroes of humanity. That's a very special distinction that Robert also got from the Visioneers. Jerry, would you and Desmond like to give us three or four minutes about how we can register for this gigantic event that's going to bring the world together with a common intention? And I want to um, invite you all to listen to Jerry, because Jerry is a very special way of bringing us together. So, Jerry, your, your turn, please. Visioneers from Canada. Hello, everyone. It's a, always a special pleasure to to be with people with the kind of minds that are on this call. And thank you, Irvin, for saying that evolution is like a love affair, <laughs> a love affair. The, the, the whole idea, all the ideas that you present are so important. But what is even more important now in this moment of urgency is that we act and act together that we collaborate, that we send this message to as many places as we possibly can. Now, the Visioneers Project has been five years in gestation. We started about 15 months ago with 40 incredible people. And 
Today, we are 350 and counting in 21 countries. And this project is launching on the 9th of October, virtually into every digital space in the world with potentially hundreds of networks like the Laszlo Institute for Paradigm Research, like the Institute for Noetic Sciences, like the Scientific and Medical Network, like Humanities Team, like the, um, the Nurses Initiative for Global Health. There's a whole incredible amount of networks that are going to be invited to this virtual launch. And so I would like to invite each of you to participate. Now, in order to participate, it's very simple. You, uh, you go to the, the website, and I think we've, we've put, already put it on the chat. Um, in a few days, the registration will be up, but you can go and join the Visioneers as soon as possible. Once you have come in, then you are now a participant, and you have all the privileges of, of doing this. And here's the crunch. What we want to do is exactly what Irvin was talking about. We want to bring it down to the level of the people willing to act. And we are creating this vehicle, this vehicle where called Visioneers Leadership Circles. And three plus people can be a Visioneers Leadership Circle. And the idea is wherever they are to turn their lens into their own community and find the evolved human beings the, uh, the people who are our people and bring them together to be, first of all, touched and educated by people like Irvin, Gene Houston, Robert Mueller, uh, Bill, Bill Halal, Jane Goodall, uh, Anne Baring, this is in, these incredible wisdom keepers that we are putting together in a package who are who are talk who are able to talk to the world in these little capsules and we're taking these main pieces like the concept of upshift what we have to do and we're putting the stories that they give us on a wall of stories now there are already hundreds of stories on this wall behind it robert mueller is playing his harmonica and this wall of stories keeps going up and up and up and if you click on one of them, immediately comes up a very new concept, the International People's Exposition, the Visioneers International People's Exposition. And so we go to the visioneers.ca to sign up. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to put it in the chat, Desmond, so we can get it. Yeah. And then Irvin, you asked me a question and I didn't answer your question. Yes, you can use this meeting today for what ever noble purposes you want. My, we are so honored for you to use this meeting. You know, my coming new. I had this brand new computer, and the sound sometimes muffles when people are saying something really important. And I must have muffled when you said that. But yes, Irvin, you may do that. Yes, Jerry, we will register at Visioneers ca. The Visioneers ca. Very important, Joni. I see your hand again. Maybe she was still from the past. Okay. Um, anybody else have a question for Irvin? Because we're going to go into our next commercial. If we have somebody on here who wants to remind us of something we need to do. Okay. With that, I'm going to say, Irvin, do you have a last word for today? Just be what you truly are, a loving, coherent individual, part of the universe. That is the solution to all our problems. That is to be who we are, to let the destiny that you were born with fulfill its purpose and you too. Thank you. We're going to go now and I want to remind you next week, next month rather, on the first Sunday of September, we're going to have Diane Ruth. Diane is right, Roth, right here. She is here. Diane has known Robert, as I said earlier, since she was 11 years young. And she has even traveled with him around the world and he has stayed at her home. And what she always reminds me of is that he was so optimistic. He never let anything get him down because he knew if he was optimistic, then he could practice the 
youthfulness that he was given as a young man. He could practice the ideas that he was given when he's downloading them before he writes them for the 7,500 ideas and dreams. Diane, do you want to say a couple of words so we get to hear your wonderful energy? Why don't you unmute? Um, actually, uh, Barbara and I had a conversation. I was thinking of all the interesting people here. We've all had different experiences of Robert. And I've mentioned to Barbara it would be nice, maybe it would take more than one meeting for each person to say something about how he touched their lives and how it changed them. And so she said, well, since you've had so many amazing things happen with him, why don't we start with you? But I'm not gonna take up that much time. I want us all to participate and share what Robert meant to us in some way. And that's actually what we're gonna do next week. Next month, we're going to have Diane talk about, do you know so many things like this next chapter talks about Dr. Kuwait. Every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Every day in every way, my illnesses are being cured by my internal mechanisms of my body. And so when she was talking about some of the illnesses she's had, and she would just practice every day in every way, I'm getting better, and her optimism. And so she learned, that's what Robert meant to her, I'm thinking. I'm not because be optim Pardon, Diane? No, I, I was thinking of that. You know, he told me that... When I first knew him, we were talking about Dr. Kuei. And I mean, I got it right away and I used it every day, every day, regardless of what happens in life. You know, we can elevate it. You know, I don't look at it. Anything is permanent. It just comes and goes and we stay elevated. And so anyway, next week is going to be fun because everyone's going to get to share. Yeah, let's all bring something that Robert means to you. Like to me, it was like, maybe I can do some of the things I've been dreaming about. And that was him always encouraging me to go forth and do more than I ever thought possible. That's what he gave me. Plus, he gave me a definition of peace. Peace is with you everywhere you are. You become the peace other people need. So what's, what influence did Robert give you? We have Sandy Hinden, who spent many years working with Robert at the UN in his nonprofit world. We have Laura. All of you have had some way that Robert has influenced you. And the reason we brought this Peace Community Book Club together is because of our common intention to learn from what Robert has given us. The common intention of us becoming, maybe learning from Robert's example, to empower us to be more of who we are, which is the ultimate. When Robert would be at a speech making a talk about something that they invited him to do, he would say, now you're listening to me, but I want you to know that I expect each of you to become the full human being you were meant to be. Now, you may think I'm wonderful. All I am is an example of somebody who is living their potential. Live your potential. That's what he would tell us. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. If you know something needs to be done, you do it. You are the one that needs to do it. So he would play the harmonica and that would help us allow us to get into who we are because it would open our hearts. And our hearts are really what should be guiding us on this planet today. You know that. I'm only speaking to the choir again. But going back to the chapters that you may have missed, let's suppose you want to hear um, the very first chapter with Douglas Roach, or the chapter two with Ambassador Chaudhry, or chapter three with our wonderful Yasmin, or chapter four with Des and Jerry, who you just met. Go to peacepodcast.org and under Peace Community Mag under Peace Community Book Club, they have all of them there that you can hear them. And Irvin, you may also go there, and I'm going to send you the recording as soon as we finish it. So with that, I say thank you for reading Chapter 5. Thank you for being part of this really special group of people who are reading together and learning together and enabling ourselves to make the, us the paradise that Robert believed was possible. And so thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye for now and enjoy your precious day. Thank you. Thank you each for joining us.